All right, this is Genesis, the foundation book of the Bible, lesson number three, lesson number three. So far in our study of Genesis, uh, I want to do a little review. Some of you may not have been here, so we'll uh, do a little review of what we've talked about so far, very briefly. First of all, we said that uh, the book of Genesis is inspired by God. It's not a fable, it's not you know, magic or anything like that. It is an inspired um, book of the Bible. Uh, we talked about the nature of the book, what's it about, and we said that it's about origins. If somebody ever asked you, what is the book of Genesis about? Boy, you're thinking, wow, Abraham and the creation and so on and so forth. Really, it's about origins. It tells us where things originated, society. Where did society originate? Where did the world come from? Where did sin come from? And so on and so forth. Uh, we said that the author was Moses uh, uh, and he used uh, oral uh, records, uh, written transcripts, uh, written records uh, rather uh, from the patriarchs, uh, guided by the Holy Spirit and he put together the book of uh, Genesis, that is the you know, the, uh, the main uh, mainstream uh, thinking about the book of Genesis, that Moses is the one to put it together. And we said there are different ways to divide the book if you want to study it. You can divide it up into chapters. Uh, there are 50 chapters in all. Of course, those chapters were added by individuals later on to make the book a little easier to study. So if you want to divide it into chapters, well, the chapters one to 11 uh, is the history of the world beginning with creation, and then chapters 12 to 50 is the history of one particular nation, which is the, the Jewish nation. So you've got a macro view, chapter one to 11, then you've got a, a close up or a micro view, chapters 12 to 50. Now there's another way, a more natural way to divide a Genesis, and that's by generations, 10 generations. Uh, if you look through the book of Genesis, you see that uh, there are 10 generations beginning with Adam and ending with the sons of Jacob, and each one of them recording uh, and preserving and handing down their records, which were compiled and edited eventually by Moses, as we said, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. So you know, who wrote Genesis? Basically, who kept those records? Well, the patriarchs kept those records. Adam kept the records, and Noah kept the records, and Noah's sons kept the records, and these kept you know, being handed down from generation to generation. All right, so tonight we're going to pass into the actual text of, Gen uh, of the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter one, verse one. The foundational verse, not only of Genesis, but of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We've, we've seen this so often, we've heard this verse so often, probably everybody knows it by heart, but a lot of times we don't realize how much power there is in just this one verse. Uh, some say if Genesis is the foundational book of the Bible, then verse one is the foundational, book, uh, foundational verse of Genesis. Now think about this for a second. We know that the Bible is the most produced book in history and is, it is the most read book in history. We know that. Okay? Even people who are not believers acknowledge that you know, the Bible is the most translated, most printed, most distributed book in all of history. Well, if that's the case, then this verse is the most read verse in history. Because when people read the Bible, they usually start at the beginning, right? They don't always finish it. A lot of people start and they get you know, somewhere through, somewhere into Leviticus there and they, they kind of lose interest sometimes, you know what I'm saying? But everybody begins at the beginning. So you know, everybody who has a Bible in any language at least begins in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. No matter whether they finish it or not, they've all read that particular verse. So we say that it is the most read verse in the Bible, in history, and in the world. Uh, remember I mentioned a fellow named Henry Morris, Dr. Henry Morris. Uh, he has a book called The Genesis Record. Uh, I use a lot of his uh, material, great book, if you want to read that as a companion to this class. And he said the following, he says, if a person really believes Genesis chapter one, verse one, he will not find it difficult to believe anything else recorded in the Bible. And that makes sense. 
If you accept Genesis 1.1, then everything else you know, uh, does not require more faith, does not ask of you a greater step of faith. Okay? Now this verse really doesn't try to prove the existence of God. It merely assumes the existence. You, you'll notice if you read throughout the entire Old Testament, no prophet, none of the writers try to make a case for the belief in God. We do that today in our generation, in our time. But back then, the fact that God existed was like assumed. You know, nobody, had to do, no, nobody had to defend the existence of God. Uh, certainly not the people who were writing the uh, Bible. Of course, it was written before any disbelief occurred. You know, Genesis was written before any, you know, happened before any type of disbelief. Not before disobedience, but certainly before disbelief. Genesis, the things in Genesis occurred before any false system of belief was developed to reject God. And so it doesn't attempt to prove uh, the existence of God, it merely assumes uh, this as a self-evident fact. However, this verse does contain the information necessary to refute all of man's subsequent false ideas about God and about creation. I said this one verse does that, just one verse. It's as if God knew what man would ultimately think up to deny Him and so in the very first verse, he preempts any possible false idea about himself. You can use Genesis 1.1 to refute any number of false ideas and philosophies, and we'll do that. Let's take seven, seven main philosophies refuted by this verse. Ready? First one is atheism. Atheism says there is no God. Atheism says there is no God. And yet Genesis chapter one, verse one says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Again, the Bible isn't trying to prove there is a God, it merely makes a statement. So if someone were to say, where does it say in the Bible that God exists? Because I'm an atheist and I don't believe God exists. Well, Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, God. All right. Let's look at another one, pantheism. Pantheism says that everything is God. So atheists say there is no God. Pantheists say, well, everything is God. The trees, the rivers, the stars. Pantheism is a form of thinking where people deify nature or give nature a force of its own. Okay? But Genesis 1, Verse one says that God is separate from His creation. He's not part of His creation. I know that sounds like a very noble idea when people say, oh, I see God in the trees and I see God in the water and I see God in the stars. Very poetic, not true. Because Genesis says, in the beginning, God, over here, created the heavens and earth, over here. He was before he made that and he continues after, you know what I'm saying? So he is not part of his, his creation. He existed first and then he created the world. And so Genesis 1, 1 refutes the ideas of pantheism. How about polytheism? Polytheism teaches a multiplicity of gods. We know just for, from looking at history, the Greeks, the Romans, Many uh, ancient people, as well as primitive peoples of today, believed in a multiplicity of gods. They were poly, poly many theists, gods, many gods. And if someone, I always come back to this thing, someone would say, what does it say in the Bible that you know, there's only one God? Well, it says in Genesis 1.1, it says that only one God created all things. There wasn't the good God and the bad God and the up God and the down God and the male God and the female God and the God of trees and the God of animals. It didn't say that, just one God created all these other things. How about the theory or, you know, the, well, it's a theory or philosophy of materialism. Materialism is the basis for most modern thinking. It says that matter is eternal and that matter is the only thing that exists. Communism, for example, 
which is a political philosophy. Communism was based, is, is based on materialism. And the main idea being how to distribute the materials equally. Okay? That's what communism is about. It believes everything is matter, right? Everything is matter. And so our political philosophy is we're going to figure out how to distribute this matter equally. All right? But Genesis 1, verse 1 says that only, excuse me, Genesis 1, verse 1 says that matter had a beginning. At some point it did not exist and then God brought it to existence. Do you know that the best, the best and brightest minds that the world respects, you know, uh, Dr. Hawking, the, the man who I think has cerebral palsy or you know, he's in a wheelchair but he's a, he's a brilliant scientist and so on and so forth, the most brilliant scientist of our age that they call him and he wrote a book trying to define or explain you know, the world and how it came to be, and the best he's come up with, this is the brightest mind now, the best he's come up with is, it was always there. And when people say, what do you mean it was always there? Well, what brought it there? Nothing. It was just always there. It just was always there. So don't, don't you know, the idea is, let's not question that too much, just accept that you know, just accept that logic, swallow that logic, and then we'll build on that. But Genesis chapter one, verse one says that God created the heavens and the earth. The heavens and the earth weren't always there. He created them. And I'll, I'll deal with this a little bit more as we go along. The next Philosophy, dualism, and you know, let's, you know, we, we could spend 13 weeks just on these seven alone, but I, I'm just giving you a snapshot, okay? Just a, thumb, a thumbnail sketch of them. Dualism um, says, uh, it's an ancient idea, developed into different systems by Plato, the Greek philosopher, later Descartes, which is a, who was a French philosopher. And basically dualism says that there are two powers at work in the universe, good, and evil. And the interaction of these two is responsible for all that we see. For example, in Hinduism, uh, Hindus um, explain the beginning of the world as an interaction between these two deities. And there are many religions that think of the good and evil, the fight between them, the friction, the, you know, the drama that takes place between them creates what is here now. But the Bible says, in the beginning, God did the creating. Not the good God or the high God. It just says God. It states that all that we see was created by only one power, and that's God. And the Bible accounts for evil, but evil is never the same as God and never at the same level. God is not in a struggle with evil. Okay? There's only one supreme power at work, according to Genesis, and it was manifested at the very beginning and the writers called Him God. Not the lesser God, the greater God, only one God. And we understand why there's evil in the world. We'll, we'll talk about that when we get to the temptation, so on and so forth. God had to allow His creation to have free will. Otherwise, creation could not take life. But we'll, we'll, we'll go into that as a little further on. Okay, dualism. Uh, humanism. Humanism is a philosophy that teaches that man is the ultimate reality. There is nothing higher or nobler than mankind. So a lot of good works are done to benefit mankind and they are done by those who hold to this philosophy. There's even a prize you know, for the humanist prize. Humanism, they say sometimes to you, oh, he was a, you know, at a eulogy, at a funeral, oh, he was a great humanist. And usually it may be because he built hospitals or she, was, you know, she, she developed something to help the poor. 
humanism tries to account for morality and goodness and these type of things looking only at human beings, denying that there is a God. But Genesis 1.1 refutes this idea because it teaches that God and not man is the ultimate reality. God was before man. God is the creator of man. So man is, a, is, is at the highest point of creation, but is not the highest point of existence. There's a difference. God is at the highest point of existence. Man is at the highest point of God's creation. And then there's, of course, evolution. Our most prevalent idea today says that Time and chance working on eternal matter is responsible for the universe, basically. If you want to take evolution, just shrink it right down to the least amount of words. Time and chance working over you know, billions of years on matter that was always there has produced what we have today. I mean, we could also spend a lot of time just debating that issue. But just looking at Genesis 1.1, what does Genesis 1.1 says? It says that in the beginning, that's a specific time, God, not chance, created the heavens and the earth. It didn't evolve. He created it. Not the same thing. Not the same thing at all. So there are other theories that we, can, we could talk about again I haven't even moved to Genesis 1 verse 2. I'm still in Genesis 1. I guarantee you we'll go faster than this as we go along because we'll be here four or five years if, if we don't. But let me, let me show you some other, some other theories that I've just squeezed together here. Naturalism. Naturalism says that everything is matter. Everything is matter. But Genesis doesn't say that, right? Not everything is matter. God isn't matter. Deism. Deism is a, a theological idea that says that there is a God and God kind of sparked everything, you know, the big bang, poof, and then God lives over here in another dimension and has absolutely nothing to do with His creation. It just goes by itself. That's deism. In other words, a deist believes that there is a God but doesn't believe that God is involved with his creation. We are not deists. We are theists, T-H-E-I-S-T. -E We're theists, why? Because we believe that there is a God and according to Genesis 1-1, God is involved with us. He created the heavens and earth and if you keep on going, verse two, three, you know, all the way through Genesis, you find out that God is actually very involved in the life of his creation. Agnosticism says we can't know. There's just not enough information. We just, we just can't know. But Genesis 1.1 tells us, no, no, you can know. God in the beginning created the heavens and earth. There's something you know. Somebody asked you the question, where did, where did all this come from? Well, God created it. When did He create it? At the beginning. Who created it? God created it. What did He create? The heavens and the earth. That's just verse one. Monism. Monism is kind of hard to explain. It's Genesis without God. <laughs> okay. It's Genesis without God, meaning the monists, they are looking for a, a, a theory, an all-inclusive all theory that'll explain everything, okay? But that doesn't include God. That's what a monist is. All right, so uh, one theory that explains how everything got here, but not with the component of deity. But Genesis 1, 1 doesn't say, at some point in the past, everything happened to appear. That's not what Genesis said. It says God did this. There is a, <laughs> there is a God involved in, the, in a universal, all-encompassing theory. That's what Genesis is. It's a universal, all-encompassing theory that explains how we got here, why we got here, why we are the way we are, where we're going, what will happen at the end of the world, what will happen after the world, you know, and so on and so forth. 
Uh, determina uh, determinism, determinism, another word, is fate. And what does fate believe, fatalists believe? They believe in circular history, meaning everything just goes round and round. It just goes, history just keeps going round and round and round. That's why it's fate, you can't, you can't stop it. it you know, what'll happen will happen and it just keeps going round and round. Hinduisms, they, Hindus, they believe, in, you know, they believe in this. You keep going until you reach a certain stage. You keep going round and round and round. It's fate. Uh, science fiction writers, you know, wormholes, things like that. Uh, traveling back, anybody who, who writes a movie about traveling back in time, that idea is based on determinism. Uh, determinism. Going back in time means here's the wheel, it's going round and round, right? So you're over here, so what you're doing is, is you're, you're, you're taking a shortcut and you're going backwards to a certain time. Why, How, why can you go there? Well, because it just keeps going round and round. So you're on the same circuit. Okay, but Genesis says, in the beginning. So there, it isn't round and round. There, is, there was nothing, then there's a beginning. And if we keep reading through the Bible, we find out that, well, there is also an end. So history is not circular, it's linear. Okay, um, pragmatism, a, a more modern, William Paley, I think, was the philosopher for pragmatism. Excuse me, pragmatism says, Whatever works is right, basically. Whatever works is right. Whatever works is right has been translated into, I'm okay, you're okay. If that works for you, then that, that's what's good, that's what's moral. It doesn't work for me. So if you're gay and that, and that works for you, then, then that, that's the good thing. Why? Why is it a good thing? Because it works for you. You believe in God? Hey, good for you, that works for you. Doesn't mean that there is a God, it just means that it works for you. That's pragmatism. But Genesis teaches us, no, what is right is what God says is right. He's the one that determines what's right. And then another one, nihilism, Nietzsche, you know, might makes right. Only the strong survive. Supermen, long before there was Superman, there was supermen. Supermen were the ones who were breeded to be the intelligent, the ones who had knowledge, the ones who had power, and those people in society ought to make the rules. Might makes right. And so the Nazis took this idea and they twisted it and said, okay, we have the might, we make the right. Invading another country, so what? As long as it serves the fatherland, it's the right thing to do. And that's how they convinced themselves that the atrocities they were doing were okay because they were superior and so, you know, if they decided that's what they were going to do, then that's what made it right. Okay, so just, just a little review of one verse and the power that it has. Excuse me. All right, so let's take a look at uh, the words in Genesis chapter one, verse one, um, just to go over them. I'm going to save the first couple of words in the beginning for a little later on. Um, but um, I want to talk about some of the words and what they mean. And I'm going to skip the phrase in the beginning and discuss that just uh, in, a, in a minute from now. First I want to talk about in the beginning God, that word in the Hebrew, Elohim. Hebrew term Elohim stresses the majesty and the omnipotence of God. Interesting also is that uh, it is a plural noun, it's God's but used in a singular fashion in this verse. Okay. Now this immediately suggests the dynamic nature of God who is at the same time one, yet He is more than one. So you know, don't ask me to explain, you know, to break down the, the idea of the Trinity. The word Trinity doesn't appear in the Bible, but the idea of it is there. And it begins in Genesis. Right in the beginning, we get this concept of a dynamic God, Godhead, if you wish. Then there's the word created. It refers to the unique work of God, and it's never used, in the Bible, it's never used in reference to human beings. The word actually means to call into existence from nothing. So when the Bible talks about man, humans, 
It says man forms or man fashions, but only God creates. Okay? Now the whole system of faith rests here. Either random particles which always existed generated by themselves a more complex and orderly universe and then graduated to intelligent beings capable of applying and developing intelligence. In other words, the same matter that made a rock made you. You either buy that theory or God created it. Those are the only two theories that are, that are out there. This is the choice that we have. Matter, you know, particles, molecules, they always existed and through time and chance simply evolved into us. Intelligent life form. Now remember, that's non-intelligent, non-animated molecules evolved into intelligent, animated beings. The only place where this works is in the theory of evolution. It does not work in real life. You take any lab, any experiment at any level and see if inanimate matter ever has any way of developing into animate beings. In other words, a rock a worm, let's pick the simplest thing okay, that we can see, a worm never comes from a rock. But you have, quote, the intelligentsia of our country staking their educational, you know, academic, um, um, uh, 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 their uh, reputations on this idea. And we're the crazy ones, because we believe that an intelligent being actually created a complex and intelligent world. And we're the dummies. Next word, need to go, only got a few minutes. Uh, heaven, in the beginning God created the heaven. Now, you need to understand, this does not refer to the stars here, or the planets. In the Hebrew, this refers to the space where these things are situated. When we refer to our existence, we talk about the space, mass, time, universe, right? Space, mass, you know, stuff you can touch, time, the basic components of our existence. So this heaven here in Genesis would refer to the space component since the time component has already been introduced. The time component is in the beginning. There's the time component, okay? And the mass element is about to follow. God created what? The heavens and the earth, right? And so the heavens are the space, the space. Now no word is used in the Bible to express the idea of space, so the term heaven is used as the idea of space expands. And in the Bible you have to kind of look in context if they're talking about the stars or if they're talking about the space. We use the same word, okay? So in the beginning God created the heavens, the space, and the earth. Again, there is no word in the Bible to refer to as matter. You know, the matter, there's no Hebrew word for that. So Moses uses the term earth, land, which describes the creation of the next basic component, which is matter. It is not yet shaped or formed, it is simply in existence. So you see, in the beginning, God created. In the beginning, there's the time. Created the heaven, there's the space. And the earth, there's matter. The building blocks, all right? And then he says, in the beginning, there's time. I've said that the universe is a combination of the elements of space, matter, and time. Science teaches that each of these elements is necessary for the universe to have a meaningful existence. For example, if there is space and time but no matter, then the universe is empty, nothing happens. If there's just empty space and time but there's no matter, well, there's nothing happening. You've got a void, you've got a box, there's nothing in it. Or if there is matter, 
which includes energy, and there's time but no space, then there's no movement. It's just one big blob of thing, you know? So time is the third and most important component because it permits perception of the matter and the space. So Genesis 1.1 says that the element of time was called into existence along with space and matter to comprise the time, space, matter, continuum, which we call the universe. And no scientist would disagree with you about the idea of time, space, and matter. I mean, those are the, those are the basics. All I'm doing is I'm showing you how Genesis describes that at the very beginning. Now Genesis said that this time, space, matter component was not yet formed. And the next verses will go on to explain how God fashioned the raw materials of creation into the universe that we now see. So at the beginning, there's time, He creates time, He creates space, and He creates matter, the building blocks of the universe that we now recognize, okay? Now some authors say that verse one is the title of Genesis, or it's a summary of events um, you know, that have already taken place. But as we said before, the summary of, Gen of Genesis one is given in chapter two, verse four. In Gen Genesis two, verse four, there's where the summary of Genesis is. It says, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. I'm almost done, stay with me. Also, all of the other sections of Genesis have no titles, only these summary statements showing the end of a particular generation. So in Western mind, we put the, the title of the section at the top, the, the, the title of, of the section at the very top, and then we give the information. But in the Bible, they give the information and then they give the, the title of it at the end, and that's what that's what throws us off sometimes, okay? All right, so the first act of the first day of creation was the bringing forth of the building blocks of the universe, the time, space, matter element. So if you were translating Genesis chapter one, verse one into modern scientific English, you could say the following. The transcendent, omnipotent Godhead called into existence the space, mass, time, universe. And all of that, imagine the economy of words, I didn't count them, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth in 10 words. In 10 words, God <laughs> explains how the universe came into being and at the same time refutes in 10 words millions of books that have been written to try to deny what God has said in Genesis 1.1. 10, 10 words. It's amazing. I, you know, I, I mean, I'm going to believe the entire Bible just on the strength of those 10 words. Okay, so that's the beginning, Genesis 1.1. Like I said, we're not going to be that slow for the entire thing. We're going to move on uh, next week. But I encourage you, you know, read ahead, read ahead. All right, in Genesis, it's going to be a long study, but I hope it'll be fruitful for you and give you some insight and some depth that you may not have had in past studies. That's it for now. We'll see you next time. Thank you.